Good morning and welcome. This is Sunrise Daily. I'm Ayo Makinde. It's a Thursday morning and um, it's quite a loaded one today, so let's just get straight to it. We look at the papers now. Uh, we begin with the Guardian newspaper. And for those of you who don't know, it's been two months since the suspension of Twitter in Nigeria. And that is what the Guardian newspaper leads with today. Government Twitter silent as ban clocks two months. Of course, government already uh, continues to say it's not a ban, it's a suspension. So that's what we have on the front page of the Guardian newspaper this morning. Losses to economy rise to 152 billion naira as SMEs migrate to other platforms. They are talking, says Source. Experts warned investment in local messaging app Cool, it's K O O actually, targets quarter four for Nigerian registration ready to pay taxes. And CSO condemns Cool, it's not C U O P, it's K O O, it's a messaging app from India. CSOs condemn Cool for using Buhari to advertise app. Well, we should have that on the front page, on your screen right now, uh, everyone, so you can also see what the Guardian newspaper is saying on its front page this morning. And also on the front page of the Guardian newspaper, you have tears, grief, as NYC flies bodies of core members to Uyo for burial. You must have heard that one on the front page are some images um of corpses and in the in the caskets on the ground right there it's very very sorry said i wish you guys would also see it i'm sure the production is working to ensure that you also see what's right there chibok girl terrorist hobby surrender to troops in borno how is that a thing and the details on the inside page is page five of the Guardian newspaper this morning to be specific. Nigerian News Direct also has this one. Mixed reactions trail $1.4 billion contracts for Wari, Kaduna refineries, rehabilitation. And the story is on page two. Of course, there will be mixed reactions. Why are there mixed reactions? You may want to check the inside pages of Nigerian News Direct this morning and stick with us. Uh, you will also be able to get some updates on that one as well. Nigerian News Direct also has other stories. COVID-19, UAE lifts flight ban on Nigeria. Five others all on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct this morning along with several other stories two pictures one of them is about brand new uh compactor trucks or it's a product of a commissioning of government you check the front page and the inside pages of nigerian news direct this morning for that story if you look at blueprint uh newspaper it's also talking about the chibok girl story abducted chibok girl a swap husband, 77 others surrender. Assorted weapons, cash recovered. And there is a statement in parenthesis more ISWAP Boko Haram members willing to give up. It's the front page of a Blueprint newspaper this morning. Military intensifies clearance operations. Find that story on page six. The operative word there will probably be surrender. What's the objective? Find the details on the inside pages this morning. Right under the nameplate, PDP crisis. Port Harcourt meeting not to sack seconders, ascribed to Atiku, former vice president. And party chair begs aggrieved national officers to sheath sword. Summon emergency neck now, Dixon tells NWC. Seems that issue is not abating anytime soon. The details you'll find on the inside pages. Now, for those who are aware of what's happening with that very rare species of animals called pangolin, custom nabs 
3 with 22.3 billion naira pangolin scales elephant tusks. The story is on page 23 of the paper this morning and a number of other stories you will definitely find interesting. The Daily Trust newspaper this morning is interested in what's happening with PDP. That's it right there. PDP BOT meets today as plot to sack Secundus thickens. You wonder why is that a thing? Well, you have to be a member of the PDP to find out has a number of riders. It's conspiracy to hijack party. Subscribe to embattled chair. We'll overcome our challenges, Walid Jibrin. PDP governors meet Monday. Recall there was a meeting recently. Well, there's another one on Monday. BOT members, Modi joins APC. All of that you find on page 5 of the paper this morning. The picture you see on the front page right there is very distressful. It's that of an accident scene where a container fell off an articulated vehicle smashing two cars on Orile Gamu Bridge in Lagos yesterday. Recall that there's always been that complaint of how come these vehicles, the, 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 uh, the trailers are not usually latched to the vehicle that is bearing them. I don't know if that's what's happened here, but you'll find the, de the details of the story certainly on the inside pages of the paper this morning. Under that, under that picture, you find Boney Committee has full legal backing, says APC. Find the details on the inside pages of the, of the paper this morning. And right under the nameplate, FEC, FEC, earmarks 1.484 billion naira for Kaduna Wari Refinery Rehabilitation. Recall that shortly after the rehabilitation of the ph refinery started the nnpc gmd had said that they were close to concluding negotiations on rehabilitation works on kaduna and worry refineries and that's what you have but then the questions are still there uh, there are those who would wonder why spend money to rehabilitate when you make you can just as well build brand new ones with just about the same amount of money but you find the details on the inside pages why that is or not a thing and on the far side fg why we abandoned negotiation with kidnappers of students why we abandoned negotiation with kidnappers of students why would that be a thing find it on page five of the paper this morning the daily times newspaper has this one the PDP crisis. I'm not behind plot to sack secundus. That's ascribed to Atiku. Party chair begs aggrieved deputies, says, let us end peacefully together. Another writer, BOT member, Joy Amodi decamps to APC. All of that you find on the inside, well, continues on the inside pages of the Daily Times newspaper this morning. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Ayo. Uh, if I may quickly continue from where you've stopped with a look at the papers, uh, let me quickly look at what leadership has on the front page for you this morning. PDP leaders move to save party from implosion is a lead story on the front page of leadership. National chairman alleges plots to hijack party, pledges to make amends as seven national leaders reconsider quit notice. Atiku dissociates self from crisis. BOT member dumps party for APC. Wow. It's a page four read for you this morning. You have a number of other stories there. Uh, that story making the rounds. Federal government approves $1.4 billion for rehabilitation of Wari Kaduna refineries. And look at this one. No core member tested positive for COVID-19. That's according to the NYC. Testing required for admission into camps. That's from the DG. And... Uh, if you quickly look at this, PMB to lead 11 African nations to negotiate $19 billion soft loan. 
from who or where, you might want to look at page 11 of the leadership for you this morning. And if I quickly look through uh, the Vanguard or look on the front page of the Vanguard, because I'm not allowed to open the paper, uh, Katsina Emirates shuns federal government Shans federal government bans open grazing as bandits kill 25 in Kaduna. Uh, that's what uh, the Vanguard newspaper is reporting this morning. Gunmen attack homes in Niger State. Five persons, including children, kidnapped. Abducted Chibok schoolgirl. Terrorist husband surrender to troops. More Iswap Boko Haram members willing to surrender. It's what the Vanguard has on the front page this morning. Well, that's where we'll have to wrap up our look at the, some of the papers this morning. And uh, we will be sinking our teeth right now into what we have for you. Ayo. Yes, uh, we, we want to begin with that story that you said has uh, been making the runs. It is still something that's touching uh for specialists in the sector and that's the 1.4 billion dollars approved for the rehabilitation of the worry and Kaduna refineries and um guess what we have the former chairman society of petroleum engineers nigerian council former sa to minister of state for petroleum and partner zero advisory and consulting joe Nwakwe. he joins us virtually in lagos thank you very much for joining us this morning well I don't know what you make of this, uh, you know, new approval, so to speak, because uh, for 13 straight months until February this year, our refineries have recorded zero profits, and here we are pumping money back into them. Can you hear me? Please go ahead. Um, uh, could you kindly unmute your, 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 your device, please? Yes, good morning. Uh, good yes, morning. good morning. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all know the challenge. Uh, they, they took a decision to shut down the refineries uh, two, less than two years ago. And the, the government, in its wisdom, has decided to go the, we will rehabilitate the refineries uh, ourselves. Uh, which most of us didn't quite um, uh, agree with at the time. So it's not surprising that uh, we are here. Uh, what we've been told is that um, they will, they're going to raise third party financing to do the rehabilitation. And uh, there is some arrangement that will allow uh, another set of parties to operate the refineries until they recover uh, whatever was borrowed before it will be handed back to an NPC. So that's that's the state of affairs as as, as of today. So I'm not surprised at the news that uh, I knew all the while that they were working on, they were packaging all that for the Wari and the Kaduna refineries. So what I call is already ongoing. I understand it to take probably 20, 22 months uh, to do. So it is not surprising at all. But the, what might be surprising is, I mean, to any investor, any businessman, uh, why is pump money into a loss yielding enterprise? Yes, I mean <clears throat> the. So let me start this way. I think it's important that those refineries are uh, revived. Uh, those are still uh, worthy assets that that need to be operational. Uh, where we kind of um, disagree is is the model or the mood uh, with which you do it uh, most of us i personally think uh, the asset should have been sold to private sector operators to fix and operate uh, NAPC can keep some residual interest equity interest um, but certainly not enough to have operational control that that was what i thought the government would have done but in their wisdom they've chosen to uh, essentially do it themselves um, with third party money. So uh, there are some risks uh, to that and we can, we can look at it, but it is what it is. Government has made up their mind and um, all we can hope for is, is the best outcome. But yes, um, it's running losses because it's shut down, um, but it's still an asset that we need to revive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little lost, uh, Mr. Wako, if you would please forgive me. Um, 
On the yeah. one hand, you say <laughs> government shut down the refineries. But every year, the refineries are budgeted for. The staff get paid every year even with or without the shutdown that you talked about. And when I looked at the document, you know, you know, released recently, between February 2020 and February 2021, some months, the refineries recorded more than 10 billion Naira loss. The least loss recorded in any of those months is 5.4 billion loss. Yep. Cumulatively, it comes to something in the region of 1.52 billion naira in one year, February 2020 to February 2021. And uh, so I'm wondering why pump money and why record the losses when they are shut down? Okay, um, so those, are, like I said, the assets were operational. Uh, upon, in, in fact, the truth is that even when the assets were operational, they were they were they were accruing losses and that's understandable you need to refining is a is a low margin business you need to be able to operate at probably 80 plus um, efficiency to be able to make money so they were not the refiners were never making money now does it mean we should just shut it down and and scrap it uh, i personally think no uh, these are still assets that can be fixed and made to work profitably however who should do it? I think the argument has always been, who should do it? I personally think that government has demonstrated a lack of capacity to run those refineries. So they should uh, eat the humble pie, sell it to private uh, parties who will run those refineries profitably. So that's the difference. Now, um, just because you shut it down does not mean you will sack the employees. So the losses you see, there are still uh, fixed costs, whether you're operating or not. You're going to have to carry the fixed costs. And that's what we see in the balance sheet, in the reports we see. Uh, there are costs that you cannot just uh, cut off immediately, just simply because the plant is shut down. No? Uh, there are employees that need to be paid. I understand they've moved uh, a few of them around, but you still have to maintain a minimum bench strength uh, to be able to at least keep it safe. So there are other... So, yes, you're going to be spending, I think it's between uh, combined, every month the loss is about eight, 8 billion naira to 10 billion naira on the three refineries. That has been ongoing. And until they become either fully operational or they are sold, you will continue to uh, run those losses. Now, uh, as you, you said, can... yeah, my apologies, the, the federal government has taken this direction, just as you have said, using third-party funding. I'm, I'm, I don't even understand what that means. Get third-party funding to run a business that you have not run profitably for many years. But you probably want to ex you know, explain that one. But you have been former chairman of the Society of Petroleum Engineers uh, in Nigeria, so you understand what the issues are. These plants are supposed to work. And I'm not just talking about the petroleum products. I'm talking about the byproduct as well. Uh, the, the, the huge jobs it would have created, the, 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 the value chain, the entire value chain, you know, that would have come to the nation that we have lost over the years. And it's all because, as you said, government has been the one running things. What do you think is responsible for that? And how can we be sure, if you can hazard a guess, that we will not go back to the same place we are coming from. We've had turnaround maintenances for God knows how many years, and yet this is where we are. So how do we know that this investment, if we can call it that, is not going to go the same route? Well, um, I'll be lying to you if I said I, I, I mean, I know that for, for a fact. But what we can say is this. Um, the GMD had spoken, I think it was on, I don't know if it's your channel, he had laid out the plan. Um, they were not going to be able to get thought, but, uh, this funding from the financiers if they did not give up operational control for the period that the refineries will be operating to recover the, the money. So part of the arrangement, I understand, is that uh, they're going to get an, an operating entity, not an NPC, to, after the rehabilitation, this 
operating entity will run the refineries, recover the money for the financiers before uh, the, the assets will go back to uh, the owner as an MPC. So um, that's, I imagine the people bringing the money are saying, well, we need guarantees that we can get our money back. So we need someone else to run it. Now, if you think about that, then that would be the argument that maybe we should have just simply sold 51% of those refineries to other parties. Uh, because again, it's another, so when you put together this o and m operating and maintenance agreements, uh, we've had experiences in other sectors that um, didn't quite work as planned. So there's some risk uh, in there. But like I said, uh, government has taken a decision. I think um, we'll just uh, keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. And I was hoping that we will not have... Um will not lose those fingers. But uh, speak to this one as well. You are uh, also aware that the group managing director of the NNPC has said that Nigerians are going to get uh, some profits from the NNPC pretty soon. Uh, <laughs> the first question one of my colleagues asked is, how, is, how much is going to come to me? <laughs> are we shareholders and all? But you know, you've been, you know, with uh, the Minister of State for Petroleum, w with Minister of State for Petroleum as a special advisor. Are you hopeful? Are you, like, what can you tell us about that? How does that work? What does it mean? And are you hopeful? Well, I'm hopeful. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Nigeria is the, uh, is the owner of NMP, so the shareholder is Nigeria. So is the, is the, Federation account, really, that, that will get whatever dividend NMPC uh, pays. Um, and I, and I, I must say this, uh, the current leadership, they are doing a whole lot to, to get that entity to work the way it should. But, of course, there are a lot of challenges. Um, I'll say this. It would be nice if uh, they can declare dividend for once. Um, I mean, Nigeria will get something out of this. But... Again, it's, but I worry because um, we are going to borrow this, um, the 1.5 for Port has been borrowed. We are taking another 1.4 for worry and um, so that's a 2.9. Remember the AKK is borrowed funds as well. So the balance sheet is looking highly leveraged. That's, that's something that bothers me. Um, and um, you, you, so if you are declaring dividend and at the same time you're, you're going with with two hands to borrow money and borrow money for projects, uh, it doesn't tell me that your balance sheet is healthy enough. Uh, so there are concerns around. So if they declared dividend, I'll probably clap for them, but you know, <laughs> the numbers don't add up. So that's one. Two, um, I worry as well because remember there is some agreement that was put together in February last year, 2020, by the ECOWAS uh, um, Billy Stars of Hydrocarbon basically saying that in the sub-region, effective 2021, I think January, that imported fuel into the region must meet AFRI-5 spec. And that by 2025, uh, domestic refineries within the sub-region must meet AFRI-5 spec. What I do not know, and I haven't seen any documents, is whether this refinery rehabilitation uh, recognizes the need that there will be need to upgrade those refineries. These refineries today do not produce Af AFRI-SPEC standard products. So if we are saying, oh, we want to clean up the environment, we want uh, not more than 50 ppm from, for fuel that we use here domestically, and the ministers have committed to it, and you have refineries that will not, upon rehabilitation, produce that required spec, there is a problem. That means you need to look for more money to upgrade those refineries, put in the sulfurization units to get your sulfur down to 50 ppm. That is something that I haven't seen anyone address. We need to be told what, how this rehabilitation, because they've told us the rehabilitation, does it include upgrading those refineries to produce the products that uh, we already have deadlines hmm. well, uh, from 
there, there are so many issues to, to address. I would have loved to ask you, for instance, I mean, it is planned NNPC unbundling or NNPC limited as contained in the PIB. If you think that this is in a way uh, tapering towards that one, do you, do you think it is, is something going in that direction? If you can answer that well, in 30 certainly, seconds. Yes, certainly. I think they are trying to show that they are, they, they are a commercial entity, uh, but it's not unbundling. NPC is not being unbundled. Uh, what the PIB seeks to do is to create a karma company. Uh, so a company that will run on purely commercial terms, like money, hopefully. Uh, but I, again, I don't think that's sufficient enough. I think we should have gone a step further to unbundle the, the entity as well for, for operational efficiency. Hmm. Well, we have to thank you very much this morning for your thoughts and um, hopes. Well, I don't know. you put it neither here nor there, really. On the one hand, you said hope, and then you paint a big, big picture. But, I mean, th that it's just what it is, just as you have said. Former Chairman, Society of Petroleum Engineers, Nigerian Council, and former SA to Minister of State for Petroleum, Joe Nwakwe. Thank you so much for your time and thoughts this morning. Thank you. Okay. So, Sunrise is back after this break. Do stay with us. Well, we're sinking, sinking our teeth into the uh, story which you just saw there, the lead headline which you just saw there. And uh, well, to do this right now, we have with, with us Mr. Clement Wanko, who is the Executive Director, Policy and Legal Advocacy Centre. Uh, Mr. Wanko, welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you, Mope. Well, quite a number of things happening on the political front. Uh, we have been dealing for a time with the electoral bill. I mean, what will eventually guide what should happen within political parties and the electoral process itself. Uh, but right now, we're seeing a lot of rumblings within the APC and the PDP. In fact, a cursory look at the headlines this morning, a lot of them focusing on what is happening in the PDP and also the fallout of the judgment of the Supreme Court, uh, which reinstated or confirmed uh, the governor of Ondo State. A lot of people saw that as a warning to the APC. I do not know what your readings of both the APC and the PDP is at this time, but if you add into the mix the fact that former uh, INEC chairman, Professor Tahiru Jega, uh, did say that APC, the Nigerians should abandon both the APC and the PDP. I do not know what you make of all of that. Um, looking at our polity ahead of the, uh, the, the options that Nigerians will have in 2023. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Mokbe. I do think that um, all of this underscores the conversation that has been going on for a very, very long time. And it, it was quite prominent during the work of the Electoral Reform Committee headed by Justice Wamed Ways. The whole issue of internal party democracy, internal party discipline. Uh, I think that across all of the political parties, you, you may have cited the two major political parties, the, the ruling party and the main opposition party. But the truth is that across all of the political parties, the whole issue of internal democracy uh, remains in focus. Yes, we've been focusing uh, very much on some aspects of the electoral acts that, uh, or the electoral bill regarding voting powers of INEC and how elections should be conducted and how results should be transmitted. Uh, but the reality is that there are deeper issues as well with our political parties. Uh, internal democracy is a major one. How do political parties uh, choose their officials? How do they produce candidates for elections? What kind of primaries are conducted? Uh, now, what you are seeing in these two main parties, and because the other parties are not as prominent, you are also not seeing, uh, most Nigerians are also not seeing that there are challenges within these political parties. Uh, and, and it's a major, major challenge for reform for our political system, how you can get the political parties to maintain uh, internal democracy or even achieve it. Well, the Electoral Act did try to legislate a bit on that, 
uh, stipulating how parties should elect their leaders and whether or not direct or indirect primary should be uh, the call. I think it was stipulating that direct primaries be the m mode uh, that uh, political parties choose. But so far, it looks like uh, legislators have kicked against that. I do not know for whatever reason. We also saw the congresses that happened in Lagos. Well, not, not just in Lagos. The APC National Congresses, even though it happened under some, uh, you know, fear that uh, the Supreme Court judgment could have an effect on it. But even that did not go as smoothly as it also have gone in a number of states. I mean, there's battle for supremacy amongst factions. Uh, I do not know what your uh, how far you think that the Electoral Act can legislate, so to speak, on what should happen within political parties? Because some people believe that there ought to be guidelines. What are your thoughts on that as well? The Electoral Act is very clear uh, on how parties should conduct primaries. And it talks about direct and indirect primaries. And that hasn't changed. Uh, what is also very prominent in the Electoral Act is the provision that says that whoever uh, the national chairman and national secretary of the political party submit as candidate uh, is who INEC recognizes, unless, of course, the courts uh, intervene. And we have seen the judiciary being uh, a part of all of this that's been going on. Uh, political parties, politicians, uh, shopping for courts to take matters to and getting contradictory judgments even of courts of uh, coordinate jurisdiction. Uh, I think you, you can make laws, but you cannot regulate human behavior. And what we're seeing happen uh, is the tendencies within human behavior to exploit uh, every opportunity they, they can get, uh, every loophole they can find to manipulate the system. Uh, I, I think that these are all signs that um, are quite worrying as we head towards the 2023 uh, election, that you will again see the courts uh, make pronouncements or be uh, invited to make pronouncements on what should be the internal political uh, party issues. We're also going to see the courts being invited to uh, stop one person or the other. Uh, again, some of these decisions are really at the discretion and whims of some of the judges. And of course, if you do have judges who are steadfast, who are very uh, willing to uphold uh, the law, then you would see good judgments. But sometimes when judges make mistakes or are not willing to uphold uh, the truth, then you will also see that uh, the confusion will deepen. Mm, indeed, confusion is what we're seeing right now in a number of the major political parties who are about to participate in the Anambra, in the upcoming Anambra governorship elections. You have said uh, that it is very difficult to regulate human behavior. And for some people, they believe that that is, um, at the, is, is the crux of the matter, alongside a number of other issues, for instance, funding of political parties. Uh, there have been criticisms uh, that the PDP exactly did not have. It was a party of convenience. So also the party, the APC, which came together barely a few months before the 2015 general elections. Uh, so... I, I do not know. Where do you think that we need to start? Because for a number of people, they believe that we need to find, uh, or political parties need to find an ethos, um, a, a body of guiding principles, and perhaps a leadership that is able to set everybody in line. Um, where do you think we're going to you know, start with what we currently have on the ground. It, it would look like from all of the confusion that we're seeing, it also provides an opportunity for political parties, if they're willing to, to introspect and perhaps start all over again. If they were to seek your advice, for instance, where would you ask them to start from? Still the same question of internal democracy. What you do see in Nigeria, and you see that at all levels, uh, people finding themselves in power and becoming arbitrary, acting with impunity. Uh, you see this at all levels. Um, you go back to the question and look around uh, some countries that are practicing democracy with us. Uh, you, you just uh, are seeing what is going on in South Africa, the, the immediate past president, uh, Zuma, being jailed. Uh, by the courts, simply for the offense of contempt of court. Uh, this is where you are seeing democracy uh, in place, the judiciary acting independently uh, in Nigeria. That's really what we have to find. 
how do we ensure that people who hold even the minutest positions of, of power uh, respect processes within themselves, respect uh, the rules set out, uh, and suffer consequences for not respecting this. I, I think that if you can get um, people understand the importance of respecting uh, rule of law and processes, then you would have begun. Uh, but I think in Nigeria, that's a major issue. And you look across what is going on in different spheres of governance, uh, how people are treated without regard for their rights, with impunity, uh, how security forces act against citizens, trample on rights. And there's a sense in which people feel that once they are in power, they can use it arbitrarily. Uh, again, they set precedents because they are out of power. They become victims of the same uh, system that they have worsened and entrenched. So I, I think it goes back again to parties determining and deciding that they have rules, they have constitutions, they have regulations, they obey it and they carry it out. Uh, but also really some greater level of uh, in, inquiry into why judges allow themselves to be dragged into political party issues. I think there must be some uh, code of conduct, some rules that define to what extent the judiciary can intervene in the internal affairs of political parties. Indeed, and a number of people will agree with you on that, uh, especially when you look at the conflicting judgments we have seen from uh, courts of co coordinate jurisdiction uh, intervening in the different political parties in Broglio uh, who are about to participate in the Anambra governorship elections. But it's going to be very difficult uh, to ask political parties to follow the rule of law, to even obey their own uh, rules uh, without some intervention. Because some people will say that the, uh, the, the manner in which political parties have carried on uh, and the apathy that has been that has greeted this on the part of Nigerians is also something uh, worthy of note. I do not know if you agree that Nigerians feel some apathy towards political parties and what needs to be done to awaken the interest of Nigerians into what happens uh, within political parties, especially when you look at the fact that political parties too are very guarded in terms of uh, what happens within their political parties. They tend to look at it as family affairs. I think you have to go back to the whole question of democratization of our democracy. How do you democratize political parties? Uh, as it is, the reason why you have the struggle within the, the two main parties, uh, and let's not even begin to look at the, the smaller parties, it is the struggle for who emerges, who takes over power in 2023. And I can understand Professor Tahiru Jaga asking Nigerians to uh, abandon uh, the two main parties and look for alternatives. But the reality and the question is, what do the parties stand for? Do they have ideas? Do they have ideologies? Do they have uh, principles? Do they have a direction or whatever it is that they want to deliver to Nigerians? Have they uh, provided alternative direction uh, in, 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 in seeking for power from the present direction that we're in? The truth is really no. Uh, parties are set up, they are not involved in Nigerians. Nigerians are not feeling a part of the political party system. Uh, Nigerians would feel a part of it if uh, they also uh, have a stake in the political parties. But the way the parties are constituted, the way they are run, the lack of ideology within them means that Nigerians really are also calculating uh, on the balance uh, what party would... Uh, Basically, you have individuals take interest in this party simply because they are looking for avenues uh, for achieving political power. And I think that um, as long as citizens uh, don't feel a stake in the parties uh, and parties are controlled only by those who are seeking to grab power, then you really are just going to have these parties that exist as vehicles. And I don't know what the alternatives are uh, when you don't have a mass movement of people deciding that this is a party that represents their beliefs, represents their ideas, and can deliver on those. Uh, as long as you don't have that, then you're going to have the two main parties who drive what they call structures at the grassroots, really hold on to power and um, toss power between themselves. Mm -hmm. Do we really have a grassroots structure system, especially when you look at 
the funding of political parties, oftentimes uh, the, there's a lot of reliance, and some people believe that that is what is particularly of big trouble to the PDP right now, having found itself out of power. There's been no central funding system, because before now, it is believed that uh, a number of political parties get their funding from uh, major uh, principal partners or well, major principal office holders who also happen to be in government. They are somehow funded uh, through government funds, not directly from the grassroots. Um, I, I don't know if you would like to speak to uh, the funding systems within political parties and how that has also contributed to the detachment that people generally feel and also perhaps how that also affects the trampling of rights, the impunity which we see happening within the political parties. I, I think that if you do have a controlled funding for political parties, and the Electoral Act actually uh, goes to some extent in trying to address this issue by making the point about uh, campaign uh, finance and how much an individual uh, can contribute to uh, a political party. It sets limits to that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these are not being oversighted. INEC has continuously made the point that it is uh, stretched and cannot uh, carry this out. And there is no specific government agency that then exists to, to do this work, uh, which is why the conversation has been on for a while uh, about uh, an electoral offenses commission, which will be empowered to uh, strictly scrutinize the finances of political parties. Uh, it is still going on that government officials um, both at state and national level, uh, find some way of taking money from the public force and contributing uh, into the political party uh, structures. And you find that the more uh, a, a government official can contribute or contributes to a political party, the more they feel entitled to ownership of the parties, which is uh, completely um, antithetical to democracy. And that's what we're seeing uh, especially playing out in the drag between uh, or within the two main political parties that uh, they are finding that government officials, whether it is at the federal or at the state level, are making contributions. And those who feel that they are making the most financial uh, contributions in the party uh, tend to want to dictate to others who are making lesser or indeed no contribution how the party should be run. And, uh, and they are going to see that play out uh, as the parties. Uh, set for their congresses uh, in, in, the, in the coming months. Considering now the, you know, the large appetite for funds now, even uh, the Electoral Act is considering, ex, I mean, Expanner has recommended that, you know, political party or campaign financing be increased. Uh, do you think that we could ever go back to a system whereby the people, that's the members of political parties, are the ones who truly fund uh, their parties. Do you think that we could ever go back to that system, considering the expectation from the grassroots as well, um, that you know people up there should be the ones to fund the party? Do you think that that could ever be reversed? It, it could be checked, and which is why we've been canvassing for a very long time. We did canvass that with the Eighth National Assembly about an electoral offences commission. Uh, that advocacy is still going on about establishing this. Yes, there will be. Uh, limits uh, to um, political party campaign finance. Uh, it might go up a notch or more, uh, but certainly there will be a limit. And once you can enforce that limit and bring people to account who violate that limit, then of course the parties will search for a wider net of contribution to its pool. Uh, so I think it's really uh, key and important that you do enforce even uh, the limits that the Electoral Act uh, has set. And once you do have an agency doing so uh, and keeping an eye on this, uh, independently and fairly and objectively across the political lines, then you would see a situation where parties are not owned by individuals or a set of individuals or controlled by public office holders uh, to their advantage. And citizens can then make more contributions, can then make more demands, and then can hold uh, those that they have elected in the political uh, party positions to account uh, for the work that they do and for their respect of the party's constitution uh, and as well the electoral act. For a number of people, they had thought that int the introduction of 
independent candidacy could be a game changer uh, for in political parties. Because when uh, candidates find out that, or people who have tried to get uh, tickets within political parties are unjustly edged out and they can comfortably run as independent candidates and, uh, you know, give the parties a run for their money, uh, that that would force political parties to imbibe some level of internal democracy. Do you, do you agree with those people who think that in the introduction of independent candidacy could be a game changer within our political parties, parties system? Presently, there are 18 political parties that are uh, recognized by INEC. Uh, so it would seem to me that you do have enough vehicles for candidates who feel um, edged out uh, from what is considered the two leading parties uh, to find a platform to contest. And we have seen that uh, in places where uh, these two main parties are dominant and uh, some persons feeling aggrieved join another of the political parties that are not so prominent and, and win the elections. Um, I, I do agree that, yes, you could have uh, independent candidacy. And I, I do know that the National Assembly, in the reviewing of the Constitution, is um, looking at some propositions in this regard. But I also think that it needs to be carefully thought out uh, and it needs to be uh, carefully inserted that such that you do not see um, politicians, again, pluriflates. Uh, proliferates the, the ballot boxes uh, or the ballot paper such that INEC has a logistical challenge of um, determining how to manage numbers of persons that show up on the ballots uh, just simply because they have issues within their political parties. So there must be very stringent conditions uh, that are set uh, for anybody to qualify to be on the ballot as an independent candidate. Uh, but certainly uh, there needs to be an alternative to the dominance of political parties uh, and, and a, a response to uh, parties who display uh, gross uh, internal democracy challenges uh, such that citizens can find alternative vehicles for running for elections. So I, I'm not quite certain. I mean, when you say that there have to be stringent conditions, uh, are there any examples that we can learn from? Have there been places where, because uh, really, I mean, the situation which you just uh, proposed to could be an issue that we could see so many names on ballot papers and people are, even the electorate, electorate is confused as to who to vote for, who is who. Uh, but I do not know if there are any examples that we can follow because we've been told that even in neighboring Benin Republic, uh, that that system is practiced. Uh, I think a president or two ago, the president who emerged was an independent candidate. So I, I don't know, have you, have you seen any examples anywhere that could face the potential problems or had the potential problems that we could face in Nigeria were we to introduce that and what, what lessons we could learn from them? Yeah, there are examples that we, we have seen uh, we, the U.S. from which we derive uh, several of our uh, democracy uh, model uh, practice um, does have provisions for independent candidates. Uh, we did see uh, in the 80s candidates like Ross Perot running for president and uh, requiring uh, certain numbers of endorsements before they get on the ballot. So, um, and within the National Assembly, uh, this debate has been going on as well and in the eighth um in the seventh assembly where this proposition was put forward uh, but didn't sail through uh, there were conditions uh given for an independent um, candidate aspirant uh, to satisfy uh, for instance if you have a certain number of um of um, wards within a constituency uh, you need to have certain number of registered voters or percentages of registered voters uh, endorse uh, your nomination. So uh, setting the threshold for uh, the numbers that endorse a, a candidate's uh, request to be an independent candidate is an important um, um, practice to ensure that you don't have anybody flimsily decide uh, that they want to be candidates. We did see what happened in the 2019 elections where you had uh, more than 68 um, presidential uh, aspirants and candidates uh, clog the, the ballot paper, and a lot of them really were not uh, serious uh, with um, 
they, they just wanted uh, individual visibility rather than uh, pursuing a serious uh, presidential campaign. So uh, we must really, really ensure that um, we take into account the logistical issues that arises from having uh, an uncontrollable number of um, um, candidates on the ballot paper. But certainly, I think providing that this is an option for uh, politicians or for citizens who seek elective office is desirable. Well, I was going to ask you whether you thought that, you know, the problems that the current political parties, the major ones at least, are facing could lead to the implosion uh, and if that could happen and what effect it will have. But we're totally out of time, Mr. Clement Duanko. I have to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. He's the Executive Director of Policy and Legal Advocacy Center. Thank you for joining us on Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you, Mokbe. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, you know, one of the things that we continue to hear and talk about is the need for us to diversify the Nigerian economy. And agriculture comes top on the list of other things that Nigeria can do. As a matter of fact, ag ag agriculture contributes a significant percentage to our GDP at the moment. How come we're not getting it right in certain respects? And uh, there are many people who would say, look, why are we not exporting? The NAVDAC DG blew the whistle recently when she said that uh, her institution, the NAVDAC, uh, decries the incessant rejection of food and agricultural commodities from Nigeria by the United States and the European Union member countries over what she described as poor quality. Poor quality. Does that mean that we've been eating poor quality? Because I don't see how we'll eat good quality and export poor quality but that's just one of so so many things that one would want to talk about this morning along some other lines because if we can improve the many economists tell us that if we can rev up production and rev up exports then we're on our way to strengthening the naira how is that going to happen Let's have a conversation around that uh, this morning. We have two guests, you know, joining us virtually. Mufutao Abolaniwa joins us from Akure. He is president, Coco Exporters Association, and national president, Coco Association of Nigeria, along with uh, Ade Tokumbo Adewoyi, who is principal consultant, Fortress 20 Commodities. He's a certified international trade finance professional. Oh, she, beg your pardon, is a Certified International Trade Finance Professional at the London Institute of Banking and Finance, uh, UK. She joins us from Lagos. Thank you, lady and gentlemen, for joining us this morning. They say ladies first. So I'll go with you, um, Mr. Wendy. First of all, how did that information come to you that our product, our exports, agricultural exports, are being rejected? internationally. Uh, how does that come to you, Ms. Adiwoy? Uh, we can barely hear you. Could you kind of mute your mic so we can hear you better? Can you hear me now? It's better now. Go ahead. Okay, so I said when that information came to me a couple of days ago, I, I, I put stuff on my status and I said, this disturbs me because this is not on rocket science. Ah, said, go away. Can you hear me? Hey, you go ahead. Okay. Um, over the past couple of years, Nigeria has struggled with um, meeting quality parameters in the international market. And year on year, what we do is just complain about it. There is a need to take decisive action, not just complain about it. And decisive action even starts from knowing what does the international market want. So if we, if we know what the international market wants, then we begin to work towards compliance. What does that mean? Does that are you are you suggesting that maybe uh, we haven't done due diligence in the first place? We just want to export for the sake of it. 
for most people who want to export, export is just another stream of income. In fact, export is something to earn in foreign exchange. So you discover that if, if you look at that publication by NAFTA, they said a couple of those people who had exported smuggled out those goods, so they didn't even have a health certificate. So they don't even know what the international markets require. So most of those commodities are not tailored to what the international market requires. The international market is big on safety, and we should also be big on safety. But they are very big on safety. And so when tests are conducted and the goods are not safe for human consumption, they are rejected. It's not anything personal. It's just that the goods are not safe for consumption. And where does this even start from? It starts from farming. So there's a need for us to be moving towards export farming. Where the farming is not that, it is just farming. But farming with an intent to meet safety standards and international, internationally acceptable standards. What are those things? I mean, you, you, you just talked about the fact that, the, you know, it's the entire value chain. I mean, I mean, that's what you're saying. That's the way it comes to me. But what are those other elements that we may not have been paying attention to, especially when it concerns export farming, you know, just to, to use the ex precise words that you used? If they are struggled, uh, smuggled out of the country, uh, I'll, I'll find that quite curious because that in, a, in itself indicts so many agencies of government that ought to have done due diligence or could have been collaborations with some people. Okay, so when we look at export farming, for example, you know, if um, I plant my granite and the aflatoxin level is high, that's like some kind of recipe from the farming. No matter the process I put that granite through, from the farm it has failed because the residue of aflatoxin in it is high. And there is a minimum required residue that is acceptable in the international community. So when you want to export your commodities, for example, there's, there are quality parameters that they give to you and there are tolerance levels. So at the farming level, if my aflatoxin is already high, then that granite has already failed that test. Does the farmer know that my aflatoxin level is supposed to be at a particular tolerance level? So it starts from there. Farmer education, good agricultural practices, good post um, um, harvest handling practices. Then, before you now move to good manufacturing practices. So, at that level, at the farming level, there are lots of pesticides that are also used in farming that are poisonous to the, to, um, um, for consumption. So, when those toxic, when those pesticides are used in the process of farming, then you discover that by the time those things are harvested and you test for those pesticides, which are usually tested for anyway, you find out that the pesticide levels are quite high. Well, well let, let me bring in uh, Mr. Bolaniwa on this. Um, well, he is uh, he he's into cocoa production and exporting. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Bolaniwa, Cocoa was one of those things that gave us a name in this country in the 60s and even early 70s. So how are we doing in that regard? And But first of all, speak to the, the substantive issue at hand of our exports being rejected in the EU and the U.S. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. We, it is true that we are having serious issues at hand as regard the quality of our goods into the European Union and US. Because the fact is still very clear that Nigerians people were not being honest with our products. And since the time of liberalization of cocoa to private individuals, the government officials and not doing what they used to do during the marketing board. All what they are interested in is to take money from the produce, from the produce merchant. And once right thing is not done, everybody, the merchants are looking for money. 
they are packing some of rubbish inside this product, getting to the final destination. And in their own country, they have rules. They have the specification of quality they are expecting from you. And once you don't follow it, they will reject your product. Even as, as we speak now, some of these uh, some of uh, some of these uh, nations, US and America, and uh, um, Europe, are contemplating seriously in banning Nigerian cocoa because of our sharp practices of our farmers and the largest buying agent. Co Nigerian cocoa is, is the best; it has the best aroma in the world in terms of quality. But when you start adding your own other, uh, other factors into it because you want to make more money. Cocoa price, for, for God's sake, as at today, is now around 50,000 per ton. I will now say you are not getting the better price of your product. The answer is no. You are getting, you are getting it best. Why do you still? That's because of the same uh, lackadaisical and the way Nigerians behave that I can always make more money than what I'm putting into it. Until we start going back. Sir. Yeah, what just, just one moment, uh, Mr. Bolaniwa. Uh, you, you talked about the marketing board. Tell, take us through the process that ought to be followed that you are aware of before any exports you know, should happen. In the days of marketing boards, you process uh, after you plug your cocoa from the farm, uh, you have to uh, ferment it for good three, four days before you, unload, before you start uh, spreading it on the, on the feed for proper drying. And you remove all the cluster shaft and everything. Because then, even if a produce officer saw just a minute of animal feces around your cocoa, that cocoa will not be processed. Marketable will not take it from your hand. You cannot, they will not even grade your cocoa. But today, all the state governors are only interested in making money. Okay, you are going to pay 5,000, you are going to pay 10,000, you are going to pay this amount. But that's not the issue. Even if they have, people will pay to you because they know there's no amount of money that is collected from their hand. They will only add to their profits. So until we go back to the way we have been doing it, proper fermentation has to take place. Proper uh, right chemical has to be used in the farm. Once that was done, and cocoa is well dried, and no any foreign matters added into it. We, there is no reason why Ghana or Ivory Coast should have a better premium on our on their cocoa than Nigerian cocoa. But because all the value chains are not following the true uh, protocol of checking these quality parameters, these are the problem we are facing all over the. Uh, in, in, in the in the eyes of international community community, uh, community. mr Balaro, yeah. one of, one other question anyone would want to ask you right now we have someone who might be able to speak to some of the issues that you both have raised but one of the issues a number of people might also ask you uh, as a as a cocoa dealer is why export cocoa if we can you know maximize the value chain uh, the end product of cocoa in, in nigeria has that even ever been in consideration? Uh, why, why, as I've said before, as at today, Nigeria used to be the number two or three in cocoa production. But today, where's our position? We're around four or five. The Nigerian cocoa production in Nigeria as at today is around two times, almost 270 to 300,000 tons per. I know. While in, in Ghana, they are producing 500,000 to over 1,000. This is definitely something that we need to give a little more attention to. Um, let, me, let me take this to Abuja. Uh, Marwe has someone with her who might be able to answer or respond to some of the issues that have been raised. Marwe. Indeed, um, Ayo, thank you very much. We have with us Mr. Richard Markham Barham, who is technical advisor to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development on Knowledge Management and Communication. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you very much, Markham. 
Well, certainly knowledge is needed in this particular area. And NAFDAQ, this is not the first time they raised the alarm. I do remember very vividly a, a time when we were very excited about yams about to be exported to New York. Uh, we saw the yams, so we were... Uh, we looked pretty hefty. We were pretty excited about it. But what we heard was that the yams got to the, when they, when they got to New York, they were all rotten. And so there were huge questions as to how do other countries get their yams there? Because Nigerians and a lot of other Africans we know buy yams successfully in European and the uh, countries and in the Americas. And these yams are not rotten before they get there. So what happened to ours? There was that. That incident, I also recall an incident whereby the European Union warned uh, about the level of toxins, especially uh, pesticides in our beans. And even at home, back at home, it was not news to Nigerians because a lot of people don't cook beans straight away. They first of all boil their beans before they eventually cook them. So if this is what is giving us issue, especially at a time when we're looking at diversifying, when we know that oil is no longer sustainable, um, what exactly are we doing about it, at least from the Ministry of Agriculture? Okay, Mark, thanks a lot. Um, you see, the, the truth is that um, as a country, we have clear challenges in the manner in which we handle um, our export commodities prior to even the point of its departure from, from our shores. Um, right from the farm gate, and one of our contributors made that point, there is a need to ensure that good agricultural practices are undertaken while you are even cultivating the produce. The reason being that mycotoxins, um, partic the particular one in, in our context being aflatoxin, you know, have a way of basically latching onto your produce and then limiting or inhibiting, you know, its value when you want to, ex when you're exporting. Um, most of the countries to which you are, you're exporting have basic requirements as to standards, you know. Um, there are concerns about uh, mycotoxins and other, you know, um, um, uh, will I say, uh, mi microorganisms, you know, which cause salmonella and the rest of them, which cause really serious problems to health. Um, so, so these economies, they know these things. They understand the risk involved. They, they understand also the implication on their healthcare you know, system. And so they, they basically create a wall, a defense mechanism at the point of entry, saying, look, this is our minimum required content for my, mycotoxins, for instance, okay? The EU has two to four um, um, uh, P, PPB, you know, um, uh, per billion. There is a requirement as to what uh, level of mycotoxins should be contained. You can't er eradicate it completely, but there is a, requir a minimum requirement for the EU. There is a minimum requirement for the US. The US is even a little higher, 20 B, uh, um, you know, um, uh, PPB. So, so you, you, you turn around and see that in Nigeria, the handling, much of our produce is, our production is done by smallholder farmers. So the handling of these commodities from production through to the transportation to the level of uh, storage and then onto you know maybe processing uh, you know primary processing before you want to talk about export you have clear you know um would i say substandard uh, 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 you know, handling going uh, or, or, or realities existing in those spaces. That's why the minister, our minister, um, you know, Alaji Saponanuno, really as, as far back as February had constituted, you know, the interministerial uh, committee, you know, for to tackle the zero reject realities. It's quite embarrassing to Nigeria without, without uh, you know, um, uh, mincing words that our produce now have been banned you know beans from from the eu 
um, uh, smoked fish from the U.S. and then Mexico, for I mean, in recent times, you know, has also uh, insisted that a high biscus has, you know, high um, mycotoxin content. That's Zobo. 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 Uh, and then, you know, you come back to the fact that these rejected items in themselves are indicative of what is prevalent locally in the markets you know, and which Nigerians practically consume. On a daily basis. On a daily basis. I mean, th thinking back now with what I know, I realize that even as an individual, I have been exposed profoundly to mycotoxins. And the implication on your health is profound. It limits your cognitive abilities. It creates challenges with your kidney, your liver. I mean, oedema is part of it. Uh, for children, the stunting you see prevalent stunting realities we have are traceable to them. You know, so the microorganisms basically produce these toxins and these toxins are then retained. Take tomato, for instance, you keep it overnight. The, the next minute you see the molds, isn't it? That's our reality. We're in the tropics, you know, so we, are, we have an environment that is amenable to, this, to, to these microorganisms uh, for, the, for, their, for their existence and, and uh, you know, um, pro pro proliferation. You see the tomato, you see the molds on it. Maybe you say you want to maybe wash it up a little bit and cook it. I used to think that if you fry the tomato and put it into stew, <laughs> you could, you know, basically kill these things. But it's not true. The toxin that they produce requires about 500, I'm not kidding, 500 degrees Fahrenheit heat for 30 minutes for it to be, you know, basically the constituents, uh, constitution to be changed such as it will not be uh, debilitating to your health. Mm -hmm. But if you subject your food to that, it bec basically becomes a uh, char. You know, so it is imp it's almost impossible for you to address, you know, that reality or that situation just by cooking. So take your mind back to the mama put. Take your mind back to the, to the to mile 12 market where you have a shah basically being, you know, cleared away by the restaurant uh, and culinary service providers. Come back to groundnuts that children maybe have to eat um, as substitution for uh, a clear entry for, for protein, you know, um, um, and nutritional uh, offtake. Look at the ones that are produced by women boiled, you know, groundnut that maybe the, the child hawks it for two, three days and still with the mold on it, they wash it up a bit and then still put it back into, into circulation. People buy it. You open it up and then you see the mold. Trust me, you consume that, you are in trouble. You know, the, the alarm which NAFDAQ raised, as much as a lot of people thought, okay, well, it's a good thing that they are trying to bring this to the fore so that, because she, I think it was more uh, with regards to what uh, our, the, the, the agencies at the ports, those who are responsible for even letting these goods out in the very first place, the, the regulatory agencies that should take standards organizations, for instance, that should take um, a better care of what is leaving our shores, you know, to other places, you know, that they should be on the alert. However, as you rightly said, it also raises huge questions as to what the Nigeria populace is consuming and what we have been exposed to. So I, I, I do not know what exactly, what precisely is the Ministry of Agriculture doing? Because some people will say, is this something that is committed out of ignorance? Is this something that is committed because of our peculiar situation? The fact that it, we, we do not have ways to preserve our products because we know that part of the reasons why food prices are quite high is because of the high uh, wastage levels we see uh, as a result of improper storage. So is it that we, ha we are in a catch-22 situation of some sort where because of our climate and the fact that we, we do not have electricity on the farms to preserve a lot of the produce, we're left to no option or farmers are left to no option in order for them to maximize profit to use some of these uh, you know, harmful preservatives of some sort before all this produce get to the farm or uh, to the markets where they eventually bought is that what the problem is or is just sheer ignorance no Mark, the, the fact is that it is hydra headed this problem you've just painted the picture 
it is so so large a reality as at the last i did tell my minister we have a crisis it is an emergency situation um, because food security is affected health and 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 well-being is affected and then trade is affected okay I mean, imagine that for nine years, the computation of the losses occasioned on account of just mycotoxin, you know, prevalence in our exports amounted to 617 billion naira. Do the math. It is 68.5 billion naira per year. And it is not just revenue earning losses to government. It is, and that's really the challenge, the concern of my minister, because it trickles all the way down. It is losses to stakeholders within the value chain. It is indicative of a fragmented, disjointed food system. All right? And so you have got to handle this comprehensively. And the NAFDAQ DG did mention that there is need for synergy, cooperation amongst MDAs that you cannot take away. When my minister was constituting the, the committee I just talked about, it, he, he emphasized that it had to be an interministerial committee because you, you, just as a Greek, we can't even solve this. So it's a mammoth problem. It, is, it cuts across the entirety of you know, the, the policy and regulatory uh, ecosystem. And like you said, it is something that borders on sensitization more than anything else. Because if you understand just the basic good agronomic practices, if you understand the basic hygiene expectations in the course of you know, your activities along the chain, mm -hmm. if you give credence to the fact that you need to also be very observant about what you put into your mouth as a consumer, then largely the problem begins to, uh, you know, whittle, whittle down in terms of its impact. Uh, uh, let me confirm that this committee was, was formed in January this year? February. February. Okay, let me throw this now to uh, Lagos, Io. I do not know if any of our respondents has uh, felt the effect. I've seen the committee at work already. Um, they would like to respond to that. Something to chew on. A lot has been said, uh, you know, by uh, Mr. Mbara. As a matter of fact, I'm wondering as well, the question that you asked him, how, are they, how can we get around or get ahead of this interministerial, interdepartmental, interagency collaboration that is crucial? And then so many issues, but we'll take them on when we return from this break. Do stay with us. running around. Keeping up with you needs a comforting touch from Huggies with the right stretch for how much you move. Huggies pants comfortably fit baby's tummy. Their 360 degree comfort fit waistband makes them easy to open and pull off and on so baby can keep on exploring and you keep doing great mom. Huggies recommended by 9 out of 10 mothers for comfort. Disruption, competition, innovation, and performance optimization are the future for organizations aiming for success. Is your organization and its leaders ready for this future? Our Strategic Leadership for Success in an Unknown Tomorrow program will equip leaders with the skills to thrive in this future. Join our University of Cambridge, University of Oxford, and London Business School educated faculties. Professor Paul Griffith of Ashbridge, Ambassador Charles Crawford, and Ambassador Dr. Rachel Aaron on this remarkable program. Leveraging Texam's tested and proven methodology, they'll develop you a distinct capability to consistently generate winning strategies and entrepreneurial culture to thrive. Date, 16th to 19th of August, 2021. Venue, Hilton Garden Inn, Birmingham, UK. Cost, £3,300. Cover study materials, accommodations, feeding, group pictures, and certification. £300 discount for the early bird if payment is made before August 1st. For more information, visit www.texam.co.uk or email exec at texam.co.uk.
Thanks for staying with us. Uh, let me take this to Ms. Adewoyi. Well, you, you've listened to the technical advisor to the Minister of Agriculture. First of all, what do you make of all of those issues? It's not that government is not aware of the issues. It's just that it is what it is. And you spoke to the fact that farmers are largely uh, uninformed about some of the things that they need to do. How then do we get ahead of this? Because unless we do well with production, we cannot do well with strengthening the Naira. Exactly. Um, so he mentioned um, sensitization. And sensitization is very, very, very critical where we are at now. Because um, the farmers are not even in the city. The farmer is not um, seeing this information about NAFDAQ or whatever it is that is going on in the international community. But the actions and the, uh, um, the, the good agricultural practices that the farmers are engaging in is, is affecting the whole trade. So he, he, he mentioned um, collaboration between the MPA. It, it is it is uh, something that has to be taken seriously because now it's the Nigerian integrity that is being challenged and the different ministries involved, the Ministry of Trade, the, the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, the NAFDAQ, the Ministry of Agriculture, everybody needs to come together and decide that, okay, this is what is happening and this is how we want to turn things around. The, the international community didn't just start flagging off all these things. These things have been flagged off over the years. Um, a couple of months ago, there was this thing about our beans being banned till 2022. It had been banned before then. And then in 2022, there will be a review to see if the issues raised have been addressed. And then if they have not been addressed, it will still go back to the ban. So what is what is going on? The the committees, who are they meeting with? When they meet, who is implementing what? Who is the information going beyond the committees into the communities that really need this information, into the farming com communities? Are the good agricultural practices being pushed by radio, by uh, media, by leaflets? Is it, is it being pushed at a level where the people who need to do these things are doing them, who's monitoring, who is evaluating. Because at the end of the day, this is causing um, a lot of losses for Nigeria, and it's causing a lot of reputational damage. It's not good for the reputation of Nigeria for us to, for there to be rejections. It's not good for the businessman who has put money on his goods to find out at destination that the goods have been rejected. So there has to be some synergy of sorts. And then that synergy will be felt when there is sensitization. This is what we have discovered. This is what the problem is. This is how to solve the problem. These are the people who will solve the problem remotely. This is how to solve the problem. This kind of pesticide. Are there agricultural extension officers who are monitoring what kind of pesticides are used for what products? Do the quality inspection agency know what is supposed to be the parameters at the end of the day when they are testing? So it's a lot of education, sensitization, and information dissemination, and a lot of collaboration within the agency. Well, I, one of the issues that you have raised you know, is crucial, and everyone agrees on uh, with that one. I'd, I'd want to ask um, Mr. Uh, Mbaram about that. Which agency should be the clearinghouse, uh, the lead agency that should be, that should take charge of that collaboration? It's the same challenge we have at the ports where various ministries, departments, and agencies operate, but there isn't a central clearinghouse and consequently responsible for so many issues that we're having at the ports. But that's, not, that's a conversation for another time. Uh, who should be 
which agency of government should be the clearing house? We know that the NEPC has a role uh, in this. The Standards Organization of Nigeria has a role. The Ministry of Agriculture has a role. You've talked about the fact that even from the farming level, there are issues that we need to address. So in terms of this interdepartmental, interministerial uh, you know, uh, collaboration, which organ, which ministry should be playing the lead? Yeah, thanks, Ayo. So, I mean, I, I, naturally, I, I would tell you it is the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development um, because we have the national um, uh, quarantine services, uh, agricultural quarantine services, and they are like uh, our, um, the country's, you know, um, will I say, gatekeepers uh, to ensure that uh, our uh, sanitary and phytosanitary um, um, uh, integrity uh, is, uh, you know, uh, basically preserved, and uh, as well, they are responsible for ensuring that uh, we do not have um, this, these uh, uh, intrusions from uh, microbials that we do we, that that creates these problems. Um, they also are responsible for ensuring that we we have a mechanism for engaging with other um, agencies, uh, um, uh, uh, departments and agencies of government. But this is, this is not to say that um, the role and responsibility of, take NAVDAQ for instance, um, is, is not uh, uh, primal in this. Uh, this is not to say that, uh, you know, the responsibility of that, that uh, you know, resides with the Nigeria Export Promotion Council, uh, for instance, is to be diminished. So, so the core of it is that, like I rightly uh, I mentioned to you, uh, the Greek minister constituted the interministerial standing interministerial you know technical committee on zero reject um, and that is made up of uh, all the other relevant um, uh, ministries departments and agencies of government subsumed into one but but uh, I, I let me make this point also very clear regardless of you know uh, the structure or framework that you put in place without an understanding and that's why sensitization is even important at the level of policy you know without an understanding of the fact that we must work cooperatedly or or in unison and in synchrony you know in order to achieve the ultimate objective if we are busy protecting tufts if we are busy undermining you know the the position of other agencies, then we will have problems. That's maybe that's, maybe, maybe that's working, the challenge. Uh, uh, my my apologies, Mr. Mbaram. Maybe that's the challenge, really, because if there is a vision, I mean, th this is a policy from the ministry, a policy direction, so to speak, from the Ministry of Agriculture. Perhaps there is a need for us, for there to be someone that casts a vision, which every ministry, department, agency, board, whatever it is, must key into or they'll be replaced. If there are no consequences, there will be nothing to stop anyone. For instance, while speaking earlier, Mr. Abolariwa, who is uh, president of the Cocoa Exporters Association of Nigeria, de decried the fact that marketing boards have stopped doing what they usually do. They stopped doing what they used to do in the 60s and 70s, that while Nigeria was number one, Coco, as we speak, as at the last time I, I just checked, uh, is number two to sesame seeds in, uh, you know, uh, as part of our export. So if the marketing boards are not doing what they are supposed to do, the ministries, departments, and agencies are not doing what they are supposed to do, NEPC is not, you know, doing the needful to check these things, it gives NAVDAC, as you very well mentioned, as its phytosanitary agency, a bad name, so to speak, and consequently, Nigeria. So if there is no vision, there is no restraint. Is that something the Minister of Agriculture is looking to? I, I, I without a doubt, I mean, for me, it's a no-brainer. Um, the Minister of Agriculture has taken the responsibility to lead this. 
um, the in fact you you don't have you don't have in a, a you're, you're not wanting uh, in terms of uh, motivation to get this fixed the, the 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 reality is staring us in the face our commodities are being rejected our markets uh, or, or our market players are losing resources like you rightly said and the coffers of the government too is being deprived of non-oil revenue so it's a it's a crisis uh, uh, you know, and the minister understands that and has taken the responsibility to lead this. As to, as to a clear pathway to uh, addressing our, our ultimate objective, we are, I mean, that, has, that is being evolved. And, and re remember that we have more or less a situation where you have moving targets ha happening here and there that you have to nib in the board. What do I mean by that? Take, for instance, the fact that you have a reality of intense smuggling into the co country of agricultural, uh, I mean, uh, of uh, food products. Take also, for instance, the fact that you have an intense, you know, um, uh, recourse to the to the borders, you know, by by elements that are that are, uh, you know. Uh, 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 you know, criminal elements to take out our produce to other countries for them to be exported. And that's what the, the NAVDAQ uh, uh, DG was telling you. And the Nigerian Quarantine Service also had indicated this as far back as uh, February this year. You know, uh, Dr. Dibwe, the, 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 the DG, had indicated that most of the produce that you're talking about being rejected at at the international level are smuggled out of the country f for purposes of, you know, um, escaping tax, uh, you know, uh, t tax uh, uh, um, or Mr. fiscal Baram, um, uh, requirements why, and all of that. Mr. Mbaram, so, just one second. While I understand no, what no. you're saying, and I am trying to really agree with you, but then it still goes back to the same hegemoth called government. Because there is a custom service that is supposed to ensure that some of these things do not happen. How come they do not happen? Maybe I can't ask you. But let, let me ask um, uh, Mr. Mufutao Abolaniwa, um, who is the president of the Cocoa Exporters Association of Nigeria. Now, you have heard some of these challenges that we, we, we are talking about now. What, you, and consequently from what you have also heard from the two guests uh, talk about, they have talked about the fact that sometimes it is the farmers themselves that seem to get ahead of themselves, trying to make gains and everything. What is your association doing? What's your group doing to ensure that these things do not happen ultimately? Because it's not just about you know, profits, it's about health. Thank you very much. It's not just a buck pass that we uh, as farmers, what have we been doing? It's a question of who are the people involved in this in this uh, processing? As I told you, most of the farmers are overaged in the farm. They are not. They cannot change their way of attitude. Until we start encouraging the young school leavers, the young uh, younger elements between the ages of thirty to forty to be involved in the practicing of farming, and you cannot uh, you cannot just encourage by providing funds for these people, providing right chemical for them. Provide to ensure that there is no security for the people. But once you all these things are not in place, how do you want to encourage people to work? So the whole situation, the whole problem now is that we have to go back to the drain board and check all the parameters. Why are we in this stage? Because if if they have been doing it in the past and we we'll get it right, why why are we find ourselves at this level now? So, the, so we have to look at everything holistically and say, yes, the farmers too are doing sharp practices. They will do. Why? If you, so if you are able to produce a ton of cocoa in your farm, you are talking of almost a million dollars uh, in your, in your post. But today, the small weather farm cannot even get two, three bags of cocoa in their farm. Because one, they are over age, they, they are not using the right chemicals. They are not even uh, go to the farmer at the right time. And the so-called government agencies, like the Federal Inspection of uh, State Produce Officers, 
the people that are supposed to supervise their work, that are supposed to give them the right method of what to do. They do not do it. We are on our part. When the environment of agri provide for the first time, they make chemical available to the farmer at a subsidized rate, which we as an association we have paid for. And we ensure that this thing get back to our farmers so that they will be able to use the right chemical. But what has what has spoiled and spoiled? And once there is a fault from the farm, once the error has been committed from the foundation, nothing is going to be collected at the end of the product. So we have to start doing the right, uh, doing the right farming. From the from the farm, getting the right people, getting the right implement, and getting the right support for these farmers. That's the only way we can improve our production. And if we improve our production, the, our our will increase. But this is the only initial where people don't want to invest. They want to reap from from where we do not put money there. Until we start increasing, until we start encouraging these farmers, encouraging young people to start doing, uh, to be doing farming. There's no way we can increase. Happen, as I was telling you the other time, what's the population of Ghana? They are producing a million tons of cocoa. What's the population of Ivory Coast? They are producing 2.3 uh, 2 million tons of cocoa. Nigeria with over 200 million population, we are only having 300,000 tons of cocoa to produce. What? Why? It's, it's simply because... Big questions uh, right there that he's raised. And he's also said, he's made uh, allusions to the age of our farmers. Um, we've seen a mail now from uh, one of some of our viewers. We've seen mails from some of our viewers. Uh, but I'd like to... Uh, Asked the question raised in this one. This is from uh, Professor Sylvester Moyer, and uh, he says that any country that desires to export agricultural produce must first invest in quality assurance facilities capable of achieving international certification. So th there are huge questions as to whether or not we've actually invested in that. Have we invested in any uh, equipment? Well, that's his mill right there on the uh, on the screen. It says that once this is done, the international buyer develops confidence in our processes and our products. It also talks about, it's not just about the final produce, but includes how it is produced. For, in, for example, has the producer met some of the basic conditions, such as, such as the exclusion of the use of child labor? Many more issues are involved which you're not paying attention to. But the very first one which he raised, which is the investment in quality assurance facilities, do we have that? Okay, Malcolm. So again, we we must be conversant with the realities that we face presently. Infrastructure is a major, major um, contributing factor in this situation. You need power to extend the shelf life, positively ex extend the shelf life of uh, agricultural commodities um, to to process. You know, you need energy. Um, you also need good road infrastructure to be able to convey these um, produce from the farm gate to the holding points, you know, at the level of storage. You also would need some um, form of consistent, uh, will I say, um, provision of financing so that the stakeholders, the players in say for instance the logistics chain can deploy state-of-the-art you know uh, proper equipment in doing so i'll give you an instance you use a vehicle for to convey maybe uh, petrol you know to um, um, uh, from one point to the other after you have you know um, you know taken off the cargo you return again to use the same vehicle without subjecting it to some form of, of uh, you know, uh, cleaning. You use it again for tomato. You use it again for some other commodity. Most certainly, you would have some transfer of toxic content. But isn't that it. because the farmers are left to their own devices? Um, I mean, we've seen how in communities, a lot of farmers, you know, they, they organize their transport by themselves and oftentimes cost is their biggest consideration. 
Okay, I agree with you completely, but the fact is that the government, I, I, I'm saying all of this in order for you to better situate the response of the government, which I'm going to be putting forward. You see, when you realize that infrastructure is a challenge, you now want to meet that uh, deficit and you want to do that targetedly. That's what we're doing with the Special Agro-Industrial Processing Zones program. Um, uh, which the Africa Development Bank, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, is partnering with the federal government, uh, uh, particularly the Ministry of Agriculture, to implement. Targetedly, we're providing infrastructure to brownfield agro-industrial entities, knowing that their activities would have a, a you know a, 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 a backward integration effect on productivity at the farm gate, productivity, uh, in fact, on farm, you know. Uh, we're looking at con connecting them. The Anchor Boros program is already doing that, but we want to take it to scale. But the question is, what will happen in the meantime? No, that's yeah. happening already. Okay. Uh, the Anchor Boros program is on. Um, we have also, uh, you know, um, will I say, uh, a, a level of uh, contract farming activities that are being undertaken by several states, mm. which we want to now mainstream into one single program. And remember, increasing the, the, uh, the, the one way that you're going to increase the appetite of the younger generation in order to, to uh, get involved in, in agricultural, um, you know, the agricultural sector, agribusiness, is for you to ensure that the activities around production, processing, are largely, you know, uh, the, the redundancies are largely taken out of them. Mechanization becomes key. So you understand why at the min level of the Ministry of Agriculture, our emphasis is on the green imperative. We need to mechanize. Mm. We Let me quickly flip this too, because you say that some of these interventions are already on. I, I don't That's know, correct. have they manifested? Uh, I know that they've been, uh, the. The funding is currently ongoing, and of course, the uh, attempt to build the infrastructure is currently ongoing as well. But it's not yet um, in operation, is it? No. Um, so, Bakwai, what I'm saying is the Anchor Burroughs program has been implemented over a period now. We currently have big industrial entities connected to smallholder farmers or small players. The Anchor Boros program have been targeted at specific food produce, isn't That's that correct? correct? That's correct. Uh, rice is one of them. That's Cocoa, correct. which is our major food export and, and supposed to be one of the major forex earners for us, it's not one of the targets of the Anchor Boros program, is it? You can't do everything at the same time. I understand right? that, but yeah. the issue, some of the issues which we're currently facing now are with this major exports which we're taking out of the country. You heard the uh, president of the Cocoa Association there uh, talking about some of the challenges challenges they're facing. He's talked about the fact that uh, because the farmers are old, the chances that they'll be able to change their practices are very slim. That's true. And uh, we need to encourage, you know, uh, young graduates into this or younger That's right. people That's in, right. into this. So if you're talking about some of these interventions and you're not targeting our uh, produce as is already earning major forex for us, for us to be able to maximize the potential, the, the question is, um, are, we, are we targeting rightly? That, that's the question. So, so, so when you talk about cocoa, you want to remember that you have sesame. You want to remember that you have oil palm. You want to remember that you have ginger. So it is a considerable situation you have facing you at the level of policy. What you, we, want to, we are doing is to pick these value chains in their order of you know, value rendition. And then also ensure that we have a crowd in, you know, uh, will I say incentivization of the system. You, when I mention the SAPZ, the Special Agro-Industrial Processing Zones Project, I, I, I say that because extension as a policy of the ministry, which my minister is very, very keen on, uh, interested in, and which he's pushing. Extension, uh, research, improvement in research, okay? When you increase research output, you need to be able to connect that to practice. So the extension worker becomes, extension agent becomes key. We are bullish on the extension, uh, improving the Nigerian extension uh, capacity. Uh, um, also, we're looking at mechanization, like I said, and we'll then come so back. So when, when are we due for a review? Because uh, all of these things are currently ongoing. Yes. When would you say 
you know, call me back in certain time, and I, can, I, I, I believe that we should be able to report some progress. Okay, so um, the halfway down next year, call me back and you would you Halfway would, down you next year is a long way away. No, it isn't. But it, it isn't, Mark. Because... All but we will certainly remember, we'll keep that in mind. No, keep be it in mind. Be before <laughs> before no that problems. time, hopefully we'll call you again because uh, people have to eat every day and they're looking to buy this, I mean, buy food on a daily basis. And I'm sure people who have listened to you this morning will be more alarmed as to, oh my God, if this is what they're saying abroad, what am I consuming in-house? So That's hopefully true. we should be able to get NAFDA to come and answer some of the questions as to what they're doing and how they're collaborating with the Ministry of Agriculture yes. uh, it, with regards to that. But we have to thank you so much. We're totally oh out boy. of time. Oh I'm boy. sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Richard Markham Barham is a technical advisor to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development on knowledge management and communication. Thank, thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Today this morning. Pleasure. We've also had joining us via Zoom from Akure, uh, Mr. Ade Tokumbo Adewoyin, who is a Beg your pardon. Mr. Um, Mufutao Abolariwa, who is the president of the Cocoa Exporters Association and national president, Cocoa Association of Nigeria, joined us via Zoom from Akure. And also from Lagos, we had uh, Madam Adeto Kumbo Adewoyin, who is a principal consultant, Fortress 20 Commodities, and also a certified international trade finance professional at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. Thank you all so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thank you. Well, let's quickly go to your mails now for those who have been watching and contributing. Not only Professor Moye sent in his mail, Professor Chris Enakena has this one to say. He says, that's talking about agricultural exports now, he says, government at all levels must take advantage of our arable land by investing in commercial and mechanized farming, by guaranteeing loans to farmers, reducing the exchange rates to single. Is that exchange rate now or borrowing rates? But he says exchange rates to single digits. This will diversify the economy, guarantee food, food self-sufficiency, employment, boost the export capacity, and increase the value of the Naira because of forex inflow. That's from Professor Enakena. Well, Mark, you didn't add the fact that beside NAFTA, we should also have the NEPC Export Processing Council to have their say as well. Shino Kingsley, with this one, talks about agriculture, same issue. Not until we drop the exploitation of crude oil, we won't concentrate on improving the agricultural sector that will ensure food is put on the tables of average Nigerians, create employment, and earn robust forex to our reserve. Petroleum has done more harm than good to our country. Ola Gunjo Aladele is talking, talking about the leadership recruitment processes. Every election in Nigeria reflects its own cultural and political context. A cultural and political mindset based on two foundations, the total absence of practical sense and the Nigerian upper management effect. Voters are so thoroughly propagandized they will vote against things they want if those things are also being offered to the people they don't like. The mayor exposure, they're talking about the mayor exposure effect. Well, <laughs> pretty interesting concept you espouse there, Ola Gunju, Ola Dili. Mutana Farouk on the same issue says the political leadership recruitment process in Nigeria is grossly faulty, although it can be corrected by the electorate through a deliberate move to vote against those who have nothing to offer. And Evelyn OBDK talking about Nigeria's uh, agricultural export says the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, which I already just referred to, is addressing these challenges through awareness seminars and workshops. So maybe providing some response there. Uh, training stakeholders across the value chain on buyers' requirements, compliance to standards and facilitate certifications such as the HACCP uh, that's like a program and also organic certification as well, etc. And she also talks about interagency collaboration. But I'm sure that people want to see more than this, which is enumerated, if she's able to 
uh, I don't know if she's speaking for the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, but I'm sure they'd like to hear a little more about how, because this is an ongoing issue. So have there been any uh, results, for instance? Are we able to measure what uh, impact these interventions have had on our export promotion? So it will be pretty interesting to hear from NAVDAC, who, from, especially because of people who are now concerned about what this exposure internally is doing to us and also from the NEPC as to how they're also facilitating this interagency collaboration. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we have to thank you all for sending in your comments and for being a part of our conversation this morning. Amal Kwaogun Yusuf. And well, it will also be interesting if we don't deal with these ones, as you have said, Mark, where what's the assurance that the SAPZ being proposed and espoused by AFDB and others will not go the same route? Big question, as usual. Ongoing conversation. I'm Ayo Makini. Have a wonderful day.